welcome to Spoken in Justice, where we put the criminal justice system in the dock. Being accused and convicted of a crime one did not commit is a thought that many of us could not bear to imagine. So how do those who are cope? We have asked Professor Neil Grinberg, who is a clinical and academic psychiatrist based at King's College in London. Introducing him in a few words is practically impossible, given his many achievements and professional engagements. What follows is by no means an exhaustive list. He served in the United Kingdom Armed Force for more than 23 years, deploying a psychiatrist and researcher to a number of hostile environments, including Afghanistan and Iraq. He provided psycholog psychological input to Foreign Office personnel after the events of September 11, and into the repatriation of UK nationals who have been kidnapped. During the COVID 2019 crisis, he was a member of the Public Health England Expert Reference Panel and continues to be an advisor for NHS, NHS People Wellbeing Recovery Team. He also established the Mental Health Support Plan at the London Nightingale Hospital in 2020. He is the current Royal College of Psychiatrists lead for trauma and the military and a trustee with the Society of Occupational Medicine and Faculty of Occupational Medicine, as well as Principal Advisor for Hostage International. Welcome, Professor Greenberg. Thank you for coming to speak to us today. Great to have you here. Professor Greenberg, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, as you probably know, Spoken in Justice uh, is currently conducting a trial in which we have symbolically put the criminal justice system in the dock. We are looking into a very complex issue, uh, wrongful accusations and wrongful convictions and particularly the um, psychological impact that wrongful accusation and convictions have not only on the wrongful convicted individual, but also on their family and the community as a whole. Um, you, together with uh, uh, Professor Brooks, have uh, um, conducted a systematic literature review, in fact, one of a kind, um, which uh, was published on SAGE in 2021. Uh, would you be so kind to share with our viewers what, what prompted the review and what were your findings? Um, so first of all, thanks very much, indeed for asking me to, to come and talk. Um, so I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist by background. I, I forensically trained, but also do a lot of general adult psychiatry and interested in occupational matters as well. And um, the reason we did this systematic review is I was asked to take a look at some of the cases to do with Hillsborough. Um, and um, obviously Hillsborough happened many years ago now, but there is a large set of claims going through uh, down to due to misfeasance, because what happened in Hillsborough is there was an acceptance by the police that they lied. And therefore, uh, people who were affected by Hillsborough, and there's over 500 of them, as well as suffering with trauma because they lost loved ones or maybe they were involved themselves and nearly died. Um, many years on, they've also found that there's been out, there's been this cover up and that much of what they were told and didn't believe, in fact, wasn't true. And so what this big sort of class action or, or it's now been agreed that they will get some money is try and work out if you have a person in front of you as a psychiatrist, how much of their mental health problems might be down to the fact that they lost a son or nearly died themselves and how much might be down to the cover up. Uh, and that, it clearly is a complicated uh, task because trying to uh, split someone's men mental health into what's caused this and what's caused that is challenging. And so as part of getting to grips with that, I felt it was appropriate that we did this review in order to understand what the psychological impact was of wrongful accusations. Because as you'll be aware in Hillsborough, many individuals who are involved in that on the Liverpool side were accused of you know, doing terrible things. 
the findings, what were your findings in terms of convictions that will uh, result from it? So, I mean, the, the overall, and you know, much of this perhaps won't be overly surprising, that, that there, there was quite a lot of literature on the subject, but when you finally kind of detect, sort of looked at it in a, in a, a level of detail that actually um, allowed you to, to actually make sense of it, uh, we found 20 relevant papers. Um, and what we did from that, what you do with a systematic review is you don't just grab a few information bits of information, is you systematically extract information from those papers and also provide a quality assessment. So therefore, you might place more reliance on higher quality papers that had done a proper uh, methodology and had looked at the details and had rather than ones who, who seemed a bit more um, slapdash. And so putting that all together, what we found overall was that uh, people who were who had been wrongfully accused, um, there were sort of eight main themes that came out of, of that paper. Um, there was loss of identity. Uh, there was stigma, you know, the feelings that, that somehow there was something wrong with you psychological and physical health problems, relationships, attitudes towards the criminal justice system, financial and employment matters, trauma, and then adjustment difficulties to, to you know, finally coming to the truth and being understood that you haven't um, done what, what you were accused of. Now, those things taken together, um, generally, although not universally, all had negative outcomes. There were some hints, and these were just hints, that certain individuals developed what we might call post-traumatic growth which is this idea that if you could put up with, you know, being in prison for something terribly wrong and having a terrible life, then when you came out, well, actually, you can cope with anything. Um, but unfortunately, that that was by far the, the, the exception rather than the rule. But what we tended to find is people um, had um, described their experiences in custody and, and haven't been accused as, as being very stigmatising, so causing depression, in some cases causing post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, sometimes that was associated with um, the, the sort of process that they've gone through in being convicted, but also when they're in custody, clearly sometimes in custody, you know, traumatic events can happen and things that happen to them or, or to their families. Um, there are also loads of missed opportunities where, you know, relatives have died and, 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 and their children have grown up and they, they've missed all that. Um, and so I think it's fair to say that the, the outcomes of being wrongfully accused are, are that you, it substantially increases the propensity for individuals to suffer with diagnosable mental health conditions. And that, unfortunately, you know, when someone gets told that they, they, they're sort of have exonerated or, or, or they're found to uh, be uh, not, not guilty of anything, that those, those situations don't, mental health problems don't just get better. Um, now, um, one has to be very careful because, of course, the people who come forward and participate in this, this sort of research may may well be a, a skewed section of the people who were convicted, uh, wrongfully convicted. So, if, for instance, if you did have someone who had post-traumatic growth and they got asked to participate in a study, they may think, well, no, my life's good now. Why do I want to drag myself back down to talk about it? So we may well have got <clears throat> a, all those studies may well have seen a skewed a group of people who had the worst outcomes. You know, we just don't know. Uh, we'd need to do some more work and look at the the total number of people who were have been wrongfully convicted, and then to look about what the proportions were. But that's a much more complicated uh, procedure. But I think it's fair to say that that um, as well as the mental health problems that had happened, um, people also had lost trust in the system, which is not surprising. Uh, and therefore, what what it also meant is for their future life. You know, if something should happen. Uh, to them, they would assume that it would, they were going to be treated unfairly and they would also uh, be less likely to use the, the police and criminal justice system to protect them, even if they you know, they were in real need, because they wouldn't believe that it would be done fairly. So I think you can look at the, the, the overall impact as being generally negative, uh, causing some mental health conditions, including some serious ones that had the potential to be associated with risk of suicide in some cases. Um, it, it, it can disrupt and even ruin relationships and your ability to trust other people, both with the authority figures like the police and social services, but also with other people, because um, how do you tell your story uh, about what happened to you and, and how do you trust someone else when it's clear that you can be so badly let down? And this is, in fact, what we are finding. There are not many people coming forward because that trust is completely gone. 
Uh, but of the conditions that you mentioned, I mean, I'm thinking of the change in identity. That that is terrible. Is a complete. We have looked uh, last. We looked last week at Sally Clark. I mean, she was a clear example of the ch change in identity. So, is there scope for treatment, and uh, what is the rate of success? So, um, in the first question, there is scope for treatment. In terms of the rate of success, we are we, we are in the dark. We, we we do not know. We do not. There is um, a service which um, runs. It's run by the Citizens Advice Bureau for uh, people who have been wrongfully convicted. Uh, when they come out of custody, there is some help available for them in order to, um, I guess, go some way towards helping them reintegrate into into whatever normal life is. And part of that is helping them to access mental health care if they need it. But there's no special mental health care service. They would get the same mental health support that anybody else would. But but there is a facility to try and help navigate or sort of support them getting that sort of care. So we don't really have any sort of group data on how do these people do if they go and get care compared to people who who may have PTSD, for instance, but not from wrongful convictions. But I think at the heart of, uh, of what's gone on with, with these individuals is something which has often been termed moral injury. And we've done an awful lot of work in moral injury. Uh, my, my research team at King's College London have been doing this sort of work with military veterans who also can get themselves in some difficult situations. And during the pandemic, it's been a lot of interest in this moral injury with healthcare workers who, again, have been in difficult situations. So this is a different version of moral injury, but it's people being let down. You know, the, the key phrase with moral injury is this should never have happened. And that absolutely applies exactly. how hard to, to wrongful convictions. So what we know about um, the treatment of moral injury related mental health problems is is that can be challenging. And, we, and that's because we don't have manualized approaches how to deal with that. So if you happen to unfortunately get involved in a road traffic accident, think you were going to die, then you develop PTSD. You, I'm not saying that's nice, but we kind of know what to do. We've kind of got a process of trying to help you recover. With moral injury, we know less about it. But there are a number of studies, and we are doing one of them at King's College London, um, which are looking to treat, uh, develop a treatment protocol for moral injury-related mental ill health. And we've just completed a pilot study with 20 military veterans who suffered with moral injury. And actually, we're getting very good outcomes with a, a range of different interventions. So we designed something, I mean, we've called it um, uh, R&R, &R, which is a, a rest and recovery, but um, it's a package which involves a bit of what's classical cognitive behavioural therapy that you may well have heard of, but also two other approaches. Uh, one's called acceptance and commitment therapy, which is very much trying to make peace with your life because you can't change the past. And the other one's what's called compassion-focused therapy, which is trying to look at, at ways to, to be kinder to yourself and also kinder to other people. Um, obviously, you can't just tell people to do that. That takes time. But that sort of approach, which actually is looking at what's the meaning, how can you repair the, the trust damage that's done, I think definitely has some promise. So hopefully going forward, uh, if that is, we've now got a larger trial going on, which actually, if that is positive, would, would give a green light for it being used. I think that sort of approach would also be useful, useful for people who have been wrongfully convicted. That is interesting, and surely, hopefully, you will come and tell us more when the pilot will be uh, 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 in its conclusion. Uh, as you probably know, uh, currently in the UK, when a conviction is overturned, there is no recognition of innocence, not official recognition of innocence, nor automatic uh, recognition or automatic compensation uh, for the wrongfully convicted. How do you think that um, uh, plays, uh, what role does that play on the uh, healing process? W would it be a quicker or, uh, or the rate of success higher if there were there to be a recognition, an official recognition of innocence? Um, I mean, of course, I mean, it goes without saying that for most people, um, being released from custody is a is is a, is a is a relieving experience but the fact is they still have to get on with the rest of their lives and therefore you know being tainted with well you know the fact that you got released doesn't mean you didn't do it uh, and, and also the losses that you would have suffered um which financially and also you know in many other aspects of your life you know, the reparation piece would really help 
So I, I'm, when we look at moral injury again, the best thing you can do is to try and make good on, on, on what's happened. So actually with soldiers, for instance, if when they were deployed, they ended up, for instance, uh, calling in an airstrike on what they thought was an enemy compound, but it turned out to have been a school. You know, that clearly is terribly wrong. That They, they made a terrible mistake. They, they did it in good faith. They, they thought they were doing the right thing. And then you're left with these people who, who feel, how can I ever forgive myself for what happened? And part of the treatment approach isn't just the, well, let's talk about it in the therapy. But many of these people also find, for instance, that, say, investing in supporting local schools for them is somehow making good. It's somehow giving back. And so what what people <coughs> will benefit from is is not necessarily money because money is nice to have. But the fact is, how can how can society effectively say sorry for making this terrible mistake and leaving them tainted with, well, we're not going to give you innocence. We're not going to. Uh, allow you to rebuild your lives because you come out and you've you've got no uh, employment prospects and and no finances. I think it's like it's likely to aggravate any, any injury that's already there. Indeed. And uh, what is forensic psychiatry? And could forensic psychiatry assist in the criminal justice system in identify when we have the wrong person in the dock if he's an accused? Or the wrong person in prison if he's been he or she been convicted. So um, forensic psychiatry you know, basically means mental health pertaining to courts of law. So it's it's the psychiatry isn't different. You still see people who have schizophrenia or depression or any other conditions, but they've come into contact with with the criminal justice system in some way, uh, and therefore, as you probably know, is that the criminal justice system uh, aims to divert people who have mental health problems into appropriate care if that if that's the right uh, the right approach. And so, what forensic psychiatrists are very good at doing is to listen absolutely to what our patients tell us, but also to have a good degree of scepticism because everyone has an agenda when they're up in front of the courts because they would rather be let free than 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 go into custody. Or, or be convicted. So, so, so forensic psychiatrists make frequent use of lots of other sources of material, um, but they also listen to the patients as well. Um, and the job of a forensic psychiatrist isn't just to listen, but it's also to try and place some sort of professional and expert judgment on is the information you're hearing likely to um, to to fit and to be realistic compared to the, the the evidence that you've seen from other places you know from statements and videos and witnesses and and and, and so forth and so um we, we our job absolutely is not to determine whether someone's telling the truth or not you know because it, it, it you have to you have to you have to make a judgment on that but that's clearly something that a court of law does and, and and not us the way we can help is we can help by pointing out where things fit and where things don't fit so, for instance, when someone um, has been to a doctor 48 times uh, for substance misuse, but then they tell you that they've never used any illicit drugs, you know, that you don't just think they're a liar. You ask them a question. Well, you know, I'm a bit confused. You know, why is it that in your records you've got and you make a judgment on what that person tells you? Maybe they forgot or, or maybe they didn't. But and so so our job is to is to is to place some sort of professional weight on the evidence we hear. I think the way that we we can help a bit, and you know, I, and I would only say a bit because it is down to the courts to make to make these judgments. Is that we can give our professional judgment about whether the the history provided is coherent with the rest of the documents from medical and psychiatric viewpoint, which is important. There are some some tests that can be done uh, looking at you know, trying to detect malingering, and that's a terribly difficult thing to do. And uh, most psychiatrists, including myself, would be very uh, hesitant to ever say someone is malingering because that again isn't isn't our jobs, but there are some more um, sort of comprehensive tests that can try to look for unusual patterns of symptom reporting. Um, but for instance, people who are very anxious may misreport symptoms. And in fact, most of us, when we go to see our GP, if our leg's been niggling us for for six years and we go there, the GP might not be interested. So many of us might slightly inflate or exaggerate how much of a problem that is in order to try and get the service that we would want so we're all prone to to not necessarily tell you know things in a factual completely factual way um so you have to be very careful um and and certainly my any of my colleagues who decided that they would tell the court that this person's a liar i think would or, or telling the truth i think um would, would, would be getting themselves into very you know unpleasant hot water 
But so I do think that we can provide an expert view and should a court ask us what we think, you know, we would absolutely be able to provide that judgment with the caveat that it, it was a judgment only. Um, and of course, a, a court, particularly a criminal court, has to decide, doesn't it, be, be beyond reasonable doubt, not not just, you know, sure. what do you think, doctor? Um, <clears throat> but I, I think I think we have a role, but I, I would, I'm, as you can tell from what I'm saying, I'm very cautious that we don't want to overstep our ability um, and, and where, where things... Um, unfortunately become a bit muddy is that if you are providing care to a patient and of course you know our main job as doctors is to try and help patients then sometimes you are you can get drawn into to um perhaps appearing to be nice to them and try and support them when actually your role really as an expert well, always as an expert is to the court isn't it is to the it, rather than to that patient so sometimes it can be difficult if if um if you feel sorry or you develop a, a, an emotional reaction um, but at the same time, if, if someone's telling you a story that is coherent and that story has been going on, even though they're convicted, then maybe that information is useful um, to, to a lawyer who might want to try and help someone, you know, take their case to the CCRC or, or equivalent. I'm, I'm thinking more of a propensity in terms of propensity with the history, uh, the psychological history of an individual who has never uh, committed a crime before and there is not that propensity perhaps in that way could help but I, I do understand all the difficulties that you were referring to of course um, <clears throat> so and just, and just just on that of course everybody's first crime is their first crime so before that they course. haven't yeah, yeah, that's anyway yes of course indeed um, and um, what, what are your what was this the conclusion uh, uh, of your research and what are your suggestions for us to support to better support because spoken injustice looks uh, or try to support uh, those wrongfully uh, convicted uh, what strategy can we use to support that recovery apart from obviously seeing a mental health specialist yeah, so I, I think I think the first the first point that would be really useful is if someone gets released from custody, you know, after a period when they've been wrongfully convicted, is is helping them get the legal redress so that they get cleared. I think is as you mentioned earlier, I think that's really useful. At least try and wipe the slate clean rather than have a slate which is you know wrongly marked, even though it's, they're not in prison. So that's the first thing is to try and help them do that. I think another thing is actually you know. People do make the transition back into into the normal life, whatever normal life is. And I think actually having peer support, so having exposure to people who have made that transition successfully, actually is probably more important in the first instance than having lots of therapy. Um, you know, psychiatrists and mental health professionals are very good at trying to treat disorders. And we try and understand the experiences of our patients. Um, but at the same time, someone who's walked that walk themselves would be really useful. So I think exposing people to uh, particularly people who had had success, who managed to do it successfully, because uh, what you don't want to do is to hear someone go, "Oh, it's going to be really hard. This is going to be terrible." You, you want to set a, a sort of process where no one's saying this is going to be easy, but actually there is light at the end of the tunnel. You have to. That one of the psychological principles is the installation of hope, and you have to install in someone that even though it's not going to necessarily be easy, there is support around, and that they can get themselves into a position. And absolutely, you know the. The, the, the sunset in the distance may well be that post-traumatic growth because if you come out the other end there's not a lot in your life that's going to be as challenging as what you've just been through. That is a nice uh, conclusion. Uh, spoken Injustice in fact is referred in our website as an island of hope. So hope is certainly what we want to portray to our victims but also to the community as a whole. Uh, and so Thank you very much for for uh, um, empowering the community with the knowledge, and uh, we hope to hear from you soon once uh, your uh, research uh, for um, moral injury is it? Moral injury, absolutely moral yes. Moral injury uh, when that is concluded. Thank you very much. Very, very Thank nice you. Thank you.